Welcome to the Humans vs. Retirement podcast with me, Dan Haylett. This show will help you navigate the intricate financial and non-financial landscape of retirement planning, investment and income strategies, and the human experience beyond the traditional work-life paradigm. Join me as I delve into the challenges, triumphs, and unexpected journeys individuals face as they transition into this new phase of life. From experts across many different areas to personal stories, we uncover the secrets, insights, and practical tips to empower you on your retirement journey. Whether you're just starting to consider retirement or already enjoying this chapter, this podcast is your guide to making the most out of this remarkable phase of life. Now, on to the show. Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of the Humans vs. Retirement podcast. I'm your host, Dan Haylett. Today's episode is a wonderful conversation with Jonathan Clements. Jonathan is the founder and editor of Humble Dollar, a brilliant free blog site that is dedicated to providing articles, guides, and resources from some of the greatest thinkers in the world of finance. The goal of Humble Dollar is to tell you everything you need to know about money all in one place without the hype and hollow promises that characterises so much financial writing. Jonathan was born and educated in England before moving to the States and prior to semi-retiring and launching Humble Dollar in 2014, Jonathan spent almost 20 years as the Wall Street Journal's personal finance columnist and six years at Citigroup, where he was the Director of Financial Education for the bank's US Wealth Management arm. He is also the author of an incredible nine personal finance books. In this episode, Jonathan and I discuss the challenges and risks in retirement, both from a financial and human standpoint. He focuses on the need to have a sense of purpose and identity in retirement, which he believes can be overcome by continuing to work in some fashion. Jonathan also explores the concept of embracing a second childhood, allowing for childlike curiosity and exploration. He emphasises the importance of experimenting in early retirement to discover what truly makes you happy. Jonathan also discusses his work with Humble Dollar and the ventures that provide him with a sense of purpose. Now, on to the conversation with Jonathan Clements. Jonathan Clements, a very warm welcome to the Humans vs. Retirement podcast. Hey, Dan. Thanks for having me on. I really appreciate it. Um, yeah, can't wait. Thanks for, for coming on. And I, I know you're a busy man. And um, I, look, I can't wait to have this conversation because a lot of what you do, what you write about on Humble Dollar, your fantastic website, is um, a lot to do with where I sit every day in in kind of looking at a modern day um, retirement. So yeah, really, really can't wait for this conversation. What I'd love to do is, I think your your background's really interesting, Jonathan. And and uh, for, for people listening in, they're here a bit of an American twang, quite a bit of a, an English accent coming in there. Um, but you have written for some amazing publications in the states um, uh, around the topic of personal finance for for many, many years. So you're hugely well qualified to have this conversation. But I'd love you to spend five minutes or so giving the, the listeners a bit of a background about you and your journey and, and ultimately where you are today. So I was born in London. And when I was three, my parents moved to Washington, D.C. My father had actually been a financial journalist. He'd worked for the Telegraph. He'd worked for the Financial Times. But he moved to D.C. to join the World Bank. And that's where he worked for the next 20 years. After seven years of the World Bank, he got posted to Bangladesh, which meant that he and my, my mother and my younger sister headed there and I and my brothers got shipped off to British boarding school, where the American accent was beaten out of me. And I ended up spending, or maybe I should say serving, nine years at a British boarding school. I went to university in England, started working there. And after a year of working in London, I realized that the pay for junior reporters in London was pretty much poverty level. And at that point, I moved to New York and started working for a variety of publications. I was at Forbes magazine for three and a half years. I then spent almost two decades at the Wall Street Journal. 
Uh, for my sins, I went to the dark side for six years, or at least that's what my friends call it. I worked for Citigroup for six years as the director of financial education for their U.S. wealth management arm. And then in 2014, I got sick of getting paid a whole lot of money, so I quit. And for the past 10 years, I've really been doing my own thing. And that's been a whole bunch of experimentation, trying this and that. I've written some books. I tried teaching. I was involved in a financial startup. I did some consulting on Wall Street. Today, my life revolves around two things. I do a a monthly podcast with Creative Planning, a large investment advisor here in the US. I do a podcast with the, the president of the firm, Peter Malou. But the bulk of my time is devoted to this website, Humble Dollar, that I launched seven years ago. The site has evolved over the years, but as you suggested, Dan, in your intro, the site today is predominantly geared towards those near or in retirement, and it explores not just the financial aspects of retirement, but also a lot of the sort of emotional, psychological aspects. What is it like to be a retiree? Because as we know, retirement is not just a financial question. It's also a question of what's going to make for fulfilling retirement, what's going to get you out of bed in the morning, what's going to make you happy. Obviously speaks directly into into everything that I talk about. And, and one of my most downloaded sketches is, is one that uh, I've put uh, kind of retirement is more of a human problem than it is a maths problem. Um, and, and the trouble is there's such a huge focus on the numbers uh, that, that a modern day retirement is, I think, um, neglected when it comes to people really focusing on the human element of this. And we're going to really touch into this because you've written some amazing articles. And you've got some amazing uh, uh, guest writers on, on on your site as well that have written some amazing articles. So um, I can't wait to, to tap into to, to this uh, with you. I think um, on two fronts, Jonathan, really, you've obviously done what I would define as a um, maybe a retirement, but definitely a life transition 10 years ago when you left your um, you know, very well-paid job with all the purpose around what work gives you to go, uh, go out by yourself and do your own thing. Um, and obviously, that journey may have taught you some things around what a, a big life transition uh, looks like. So in, in your personal experience and your vast experience in writing about personal finance and retirement, on two fronts when it comes to uh, challenges and risks, what, what do you believe are some of the biggest financial challenges and risks in a modern day retirement? And then off the back of that, what do you believe are some of the biggest kind of human risks uh, to retirement, and I'm sure we'll go off in many directions based on your based on your answers. So I think the number one financial risk, Dan, is longevity risk. This risk that you know we're going to live longer than we ever planned for. Uh, you know, people today, if they retire in their early sixties, they can easily live three decades or longer, and that, of course, is a you know a huge financial question. You know, how are you going to make sure that you don't outlive your money? And that probably is the number one issue that, you know, the financial planning industry, the investment advisory industry is focused on. And it is indeed a crucial question. But I think on the human side, one of the issues is that people seem to be remarkably pessimistic about their life expectancy. You know, I see over and over again that people are inclined to spend heavily early in retirement because they think that then they're either not going to be around later or they're not going to particularly, you know, appreciate the money later because they're just going to sit around and watch TV and eat eat cheese doodles. You know, second, you know, people are remarkably reluctant to pay up for guaranteed income. They won't delay their, you know, government pension to get a larger payout. They won't buy immediate fixed annuities so they have more guaranteed income. You know, all of these questions, all of these sort of responses to the you know, longevity risk put them at risk financially. But I think there's also a sort of an emotional risk here, which is that people you know, retire in their early 60s and they say, well, you know, it's not going to be that long. I'm not going to you know, live much longer. And so they don't set out to have a purposeful retirement. They set out to have fun. And there is a limit to how much 
as humans, we really enjoy fun. You know, there are sort of two different types of happiness. There's this ha- that sort of happiness where you go down to the pub and you have a couple of pints with your mates. And there's the sort of happiness that comes from doing activities that we find fulfilling, that gives us a sense of purpose, that we feel are important, that we're passionate about. And I think in designing their retirement, folks focus far too much on the going down to the pub and having a couple of pints type of happiness and not nearly enough on this having a fulfilling retirement where you do something that gives you that sense of purpose. Mm. No, I couldn't agree more. I, I, I often hear, I play a lot of golf and I play a lot of golf with people that are retired in, in brackets. And the common feedback is that actually my retirement has just ruined my love for the game because the game has come more like a job than it was a hobby before. Right? I'm playing too much. And, you know, my job now is three days a week playing golf. And I, I don't, you know, so, so again, it's that, it's that thing. I think what, what's really interesting about what you said is that the maths equation has taken over people's um, desire to explore fixed term annuity. So people have gone, oh, rates are low. There's no point in me doing it because the maths don't add up. Yet what they have neglected, in my opinion, and I'll be interested to hear your thoughts on this, is actually the behavioral and emotional impact that a fixed uh, income can give you and actually taking away, effectively, you're insuring away um, that living too long, aren't you? That's kind of what you're what you're doing with these things. Um, I think it's really interesting that people have decided to put the numbers over the fact that these uh, annuities could give them much more comfort and security in retirement. Do you see that? No, absolutely, Dan. I think there are a couple of interesting aspects of this. One is that you know we know retirees who have guaranteed income, you know, such as a pension, tend to be happier. So people can go out and if they don't have a pension, buy their own pension, take part of their savings and use it to buy an immediate fixed annuity that's going to give them income every month. And that regular income can give them that sense of financial security, which is crucial to happiness. And yet, you know, bizarrely, people will spend 30 years working at a job they hate in order to qualify for a healthy pension. And yet they won't actually take their own money upon retirement and use it to buy the same thing. I mean, what does that say to you about how we value time versus money, that we're willing to devote those 30 years to a company that we don't care about just to get that pension? We certainly aren't going to spend our money to get that same income stream. But the other thing that I think people fail to mention and and think about is that if you do have that guaranteed fixed income, it actually frees you up to be much more aggressive with the rest of your portfolio. Um, I suspect we'll touch on this later, but it, you know everybody has some mix of, I want to die broke versus I have this huge bequest motive and I want to leave a lot of money to my kids and I want to leave a lot of money to charity. And we all find ourselves somewhere on that spectrum. If you have some sort of bequest motive, if you want to ensure that your portfolio grows over time, you know, the, the number one thing you can do is to invest heavily in the stock market, some broadly diversified index funds to capture that its long run returns. So what as a retiree is going to free you up to make that sort of commitment to the stock market? And the answer is having guaranteed lifetime income. So buying that immediate fixed annuity may sound like you're sacrificing your wealth because you're writing this big check to the insurance company. But unless you keel over tomorrow, the long run result is that you're probably going to end up with more wealth at the end of your life. Mm. And, and, and also, Jonathan, again, I'd be interested to hear your thoughts on this. I think on, on a couple of other fronts, what happens there in my experience is that you, you free up, as you said, to be a little bit more aggressive with the portfolio. Aggressive is probably maybe not not the right word. You free up to invest your money in a way that makes sure that you retain future purchasing power. So the other big thing is inflation. So if you are if you've got some guaranteed income, then you should be more inclined to invest in a way that you should invest anyway to help with uh, you know um, inflation protection and, and and future purchasing power. Because um, I see a lot of people. Um, neglect that side of thing. It, it, it's I need to kind of have an amount of bonds. This old adage of aging bonds and all that rubbish that gets spouted off. Um, and, and all you're doing is that you are you are neglecting 
your future self and putting more reliance on your family and the state and the government to look after you in later life because things absolutely get will, will get more expensive over a 30-year time period. So not only will it allow you to do that, but I also think it might allow you to be a little bit more aggressive in your spending. So, you know, in those kind of go-go years, in the time when you are as healthy as you're going to be and as time rich as you're going to be and as energized as you're going to be, then having some security around your, your guaranteed income can often, in my experience, these people feel like they can spend a little bit more discretionary money and they can go on the thing and enjoy their time a little bit more. Have you kind of seen that? And is that a trend that you that you see kind of as you as you write about this stuff? So absolutely. I mean, if you know everything that you have is hinging on the financial markets, meaning the stock and bond market. Obviously, whenever you see some sort of dip in the financial markets, it's going to cause a tightness in your chest and you're going to think, well, maybe we won't take that expensive vacation this year. Maybe we should, you know, maybe we should throw back on the spending. I think one of the things that uh, I see is that people don't really understand what their life expectancy is going to be upon retirement. And there's all kinds of confusion around this. I mean, I've had people who look at life expectancies as a birth and say, well, you know, I'm 65. Somebody, you know, who was born in the year I was born typically dies by 75 or 77. I haven't, I've only got 10 or a dozen years left. But as we know, life expectancy as a birth is not the same as life expectancy as of age 65. There are all those unfortunate people who die, you know, before they get to 65, particularly, I regret to say, young men, they seem to be very good at killing themselves off. Once you drop out all those young men who kill themselves in the uh, late teen and early 20s, life expectancy vastly improves. At 65, you're not looking at 10 or a dozen more years. You're probably looking on average at 10 or 22 more years. And then on top of that, if you are somebody who's been reasonably good about your health, you know, you can probably tack another four or five years onto that. So at age 65, you might be looking at a typical life expectancy, if you've taken care of your health and so on, of around 90. And that means that's the median. So there's a good chance that you're going to live beyond that. Now, why do I go through all of that nonsense? Well, at age 65, if that's the year you retire, you may be looking at 25 plus years. And that has two implications. One is you're not going to need all your savings in year one. So there's no need to have all of that savings in short-term bonds, to have it all in cash investments. You have plenty of time to invest for the long haul. And indeed, you have plenty of time for inflation to put a serious dent in your lifestyle. So that's why you should continue to invest for the long haul with at least a significant portion of your portfolio. Mm. It, it's interesting, isn't it, longevity? And I think there is, as you've rightly said, there's a, there's a huge gap in education about what that is and what it means. Um, the Office of National Statistics here in the UK published figures just based on if you're what sex you are and how old you are. And it's it's obviously backward looking data, right? It's kind of like, well, the data of what's... But if we look forward and we think about you know, all of the projections that are coming out from these various research institutions um, with modern medicine and diets are better and people are exercising better and longer and uh, et cetera, then we know that that life expectancy is, 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 is reaching out significantly. The other thing that people don't appreciate is the maths behind it, i.e. The, the, if you've got two people, so this is not just an individual, if you're married or you have a partner, the chances of one of you getting to age 90 to 95 is not it's not kind of you don't half it, it you know there's a there's a significant um add on to the chances percentage chances that one of you makes it i, I was working with a, a new couple yesterday and uh, part of the uh, stress testing software that we use it's got these kind of forward looking longevity calculators in it and they're both 60 and there's a and i, and I showed them there's a 50% chance that one of them will reach 94 and and it shocked them. They were like, "What?" I was like, "Yeah, there's, you know, there's a ten percent chance that one of you will get to age hundred. So, it's you know, I think the biggest takeaway for me is if you're a couple, this is about the lifespan of kind of you, both of you, and your money needs to last till the end of your partner's life, your 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 spouse's life. And I think it's sort of there's an additional uh, factor to consider here, which is 
that there is evidence that couples, the two of them, tend to live longer than single individuals. And it goes to the importance of social interaction in retirement. So if you have a spouse or a partner, you know, you have a built-in social life. Um, you should, social life should be larger than just your spouse or partner, but certainly you are getting some social interaction every day. And it's the stats suggest that that not only enhances your retirement, but also tends to lead to longer longevity. Mm, absolutely. Absolutely. We, we, we'll come back to that point. I, I, I just want to stay on the financial element for, for another couple of minutes, and then I'm going to move on to a couple of things you've said, um, which I think really kind of delves into the, the human uh, side of this. Um, we, we've talked about kind of uh, equities and bonds in as an investment you know, mix and guaranteed income. What are your thoughts about investing in retirement in terms of trying to educate people the in the benefits of holding equities we, we've touched on it a little bit but i think it's really important just to have a spend a bit of time on this because i, st- I work with so many people i start to work with them where they're in these glide path funds or these lifestyling funds that are gliding them down into bonds and government bonds or they're very they come to a point in their life where they become very um wary of the markets and losses and 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 everything like that however um as you rightly said this could be an investment journey for as long in retirement as you were accumulating the assets so what are your views about kind of portfolio makeup and how we should start to really view investing our money in retirement so dan a lot of people are out there and say oh well well, you know once you reach retirement age you should have you know only half of your portfolio in stocks, or you should have a balanced portfolio with 60% stocks or 40% bonds. And what I would say is, well, let's let's look at these numbers from the ground up. You know, the first thing you need to figure out is what other income do you have? You know, what are you going to get from your government pension? What are you going to get from any, you know, fixed annuity that you purchase? What are you going to get from any corporate pension that you have? You're going to have that level of income. And then you say, so how much income do I need on top of that? In other words, how much income is going to come from my portfolio. And what I would say is, okay, you know, let's say that, you know, you need on top of whatever you get, you know, from the government, from your pension, from your immediate annuity, let's say that you need, you know, pull a number out of the air. Let's say you need $20,000 a year from savings, right? So I would say, well, you should probably have at least five times that set aside in cash investments in short-term bonds. So five times 20,000, that's $100,000 um, or 100,000 pounds if you're in the UK. All right, so that's what you need to have in super conservative investments. Depending on your risk tolerance, I would say, well, after that, really, you know, it's it's up to you. If you're aggressive, I could see putting much of or even all of that money into the stock market. Now, I'm not saying that, you know, you should have 60-40 or you should have 50-50. All I'm saying is you should have those five years of, you know, portfolio withdrawals set aside in conservative investments. When I do those numbers for myself, I end up with about 90% in stocks. And in fact, I have about 90% in stocks. I'm 61 years old and I have 90% in stocks because I look at the numbers and I'm only going to need about 10% of my portfolio in order to cover my living expenses over the next five years once I stop working and once I start taking my U.S. government um, Social Security pension. I mean, is that crazy? Well, for a lot of people, yeah, that would be way out on the risk spectrum. But when I look at my finances, having 90% in stocks actually makes total financial sense. And given that it's important to me to have significant money to give to my kids and to bequeath to charity, it strikes me as a rational strategy. Hi, everyone. Dan here. I just wanted to jump in real quick to say that if you are thinking about or unsure where to start with your retirement plans, then I've put together what I believe to be one of the best free resources for you. My Retirement Toolkit is packed with videos, guides, webinars, worksheets, blogs, and podcast episodes, and is completely free to download. 
Just go to the show notes where you will find the link. Now, let's get back to the show. It's really interesting. In, in a lot of the work we do around looking at structuring um, a, a portfolio or assets for income, um, cash is so important, you know, and and um, I think, and so we very similar to you, Jonathan, what we look at is we go, well, you need about one to two years worth of expenditure sitting in cash. Because if you are taking money from an invested pot, then you want the ability to not take that and go to cash. If we start seeing the again the sequencing risk of return that I've talked about on the podcast before, you know you don't want to be taking your money out of a falling market, particularly in the first three to four years of your retirement, because you can hurt the longevity of the pot. So that's great. Then let's look at the non-negotiable things. So I say to I say to people, what would you be really, really, really annoyed about over the next three years that you couldn't spend your money on? You know, what if there was a 5, 10, 15% fall in the market, you would be hesitant, as you said about 20, 10, 15 minutes ago, hesitant to go, yes, I can do that. Is it a holiday? Is it a new car? Is it home improvements? Is it a gift to your children for a wedding or whatever that is? Whatever that says, put that in cash. So now we're going, right, you've got two, three, four, five years in cash. That frees up all of your short-term spending. Add on some income, some annuity, new, uh, some guaranteed income. Add in some state pension at some point. That means you are freer now to think about the risk of the, the job of the money that you're going to invest in, and the job of that money is to replenish your cash pots over the medium term and to retain your purchasing power over the long term. And I think that way you can start to free up, um, free up your plans. Um, risk, not your attitude to risk, but the, the risk towards your plans of having money invest in the stock market. Because again, I, I'm interested to hear your thoughts on this, because I think people have got risk all wrong. People confuse volatility with risk. And actually, it's not. It's welcomed in, in investing circles, because that's what that's what gives us the, the kind of long term return, right? Yeah, no, absolutely. In retirement, you need to continue to embrace investment risk. And, you know, investment risk is conventionally measured using volatility. But I would argue that, you know, the much bigger risk is this risk from long, you know, of longevity that you're out going to outlive your savings. There is this risk from inflation, you know, even modest inflation over 30 years will cut the spending power of your portfolio in half if it's not growing. So you know, what's the risk that you you know you want you want to take? Do you want to take uh longevity risk? Do you want to take inflation risk? Or would you happily accept a little bit of volatility in the return for not having to worry about longevity risk and not having to worry about inflation risk? Mm. Yeah, and in the analysis that we do on the portfolios over a 20-year time horizon, the only asset classes that have lost you money or the only portfolios that have lost you money are those that are um, invested more in bonds and equities. So over a 20-year time horizon, those with 60% or more in equities, the worst returns are still positive. Those with 40% in um, 60% or more in bonds, the worst returns are negative. So you look at that and you think, well, tell me what where the real, the real risk lies when you're investing your money. I think one of the things that we're, we're sort of dancing around here um, is this notion of, you know, how long retirement really is. I mean, you know, when, you know, my grandparents' generation retired, you know, retirement was a, maybe a 10-year endeavor. Um, inflation wasn't a big deal. You didn't need to worry about whether your, your assets were going to be eroded by inflation. Today, we're talking about much longer time periods. Yeah, there are always those unfortunate individuals, you know, who die in their late 60s. I mean, yes, that's obviously a risk. But the numbers tell us that if, you know, you've been reasonably careful about your health through your life, that you are looking at that 90 plus year old future self. And managing money with that goal in mind is, you know, a totally different ball game. You cannot just put everything in a savings account anymore. You need to have some sort of long-term strategy. But, and I, I don't want to totally hijack the conversation here, Dan, but I think it also sort of raises big issues about, you know, how 
you know, our current conception of retirement and whether we've got it all wrong. Is, you know, are we really hardwired in order to, you know, spend 25, 30 years sitting around doing nothing for the rest of our life? I think that the conception of retirement, we, you know, bust our ass for four decades in order that we can spend three decades sitting around doing nothing is completely absurd and that we actually need to totally rethink this conception of retirement. And I think the one thing that we should put back on the table that a lot of people have taken off is this notion that maybe you should keep working at least Uh, part-time. Yeah. Uh, look, I, I mean, I had a great conversation with Carl Richards, and 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 he's got this notion that retirement is a flawed concept, and and that's the whole part part of this point of the work that I do on a daily basis with the clients and with this podcast, right? The humans versus retirement. We are, we we've kind of got this vision of what retirement was, and life has moved on so much, right? Uh, you know, as you said, it, it's it's only a generation ago that people retired with with a final salary or defined benefit pension and all of the risks around markets and inflation and, you know, spending and longevity were, were, were not even on the agenda then. And so I think at rightly, as you say, the whole notion of retirement needs to be, uh, needs to be revisited. Um, I'm going to come back to the work bit in a minute um, with you, because I think it's a really important point. I know you've written uh, about this. I want to bridge the gap though with, with, with you between now, the kind of financial risks and challenges and the human risks. So I'm going to go into a topic um, that I think is uh, a bit of both, uh, and then we'll go into more about the human. But you you wrote uh, an article recently called Retirement Roulette, which I really, really loved. Um, and, and in that article, you discussed the challenges of kind of generating an income in retirement that's going to last a lifetime. And you highlight um, seven issues that will affect everyone in different ways. And I think the premise of that article is that there is no one uh, one way to do this. We've talked a lot about investing money, but one of those things is about generating kind of income. I'd love you to talk about those seven issues that you highlighted and and, and go into them in a bit more uh, a bit more a bit more detail. So I think. Uh, and I'll, I'll kind of mention them. We, we, I found it fascinating reading it. Kind of, it's about the kids. It's how optimistic we are, the risks that we hate, the income that we want, whether to work, which is what you just said, when to spend, when we start to slip. Um, and so I think that you know it's really interesting as a framework to think about how we uniquely think about what's required for us as an income. So you know, some of these we've already t- touched on, Dan. For instance, you know. The first one about the kids. This this is about this notion of a quest motive. You know, do you want to have a substantial sum left over at the end of your life to give to charity or to give to your children? You know, for some people, the answer will be no. They they they're happy to you know die broke if that's at all possible. Um, but for others like me, yeah, I have a huge bequest motive. I want to be able to uh, to help my kids, and I want to be able to you know pass. A significant sum to charity, and that varies how I manage my money versus other people. Clearly, if you have a strong bequest motive, you're going to be more careful about spending. But also, you know, you probably want to invest more in the stock market in order to see your portfolio grow over time. So, yeah, that's a that's a big issue, and I think it's one of the things that people should put first and foremost when they think about okay, what's my retirement income strategy going to be. And then we've mentioned about the kind of how how optimistic you are about life. I, I read something really interesting that um, if we, we kind of carry our emotions into retirement, we kind of carry those. So if we're if we're not particularly optimistic before retirement, we can't just click our fingers and be eternally optimistic after retirement. So I think kind of our emotional makeup is a is is a big part of. Um, the, kind of a challenge in generating uh, an income, right? Sure. I mean, people who are not optimistic about their life expectancy are going to be more reluctant to delay taking their government check. They're going to be more reluctant to annuitize part of their savings. Clearly, if you are optimistic about your life expectancy, you are more likely to annuitize and delay uh, those that government pension. Uh, one thing that people should realize is that, you know, 
when we think about life expectancy, we tend to look to our parents and our grandparents. But actually, the research says that you know, genetics is only a small part of the equation here, that just because you know, your grandparents died young or your parents died young doesn't mean that you will too. So don't make big bets based on that family health history. Yeah, really interesting. Let's let's go into a bit more detail then about uh, wh- whether to work because I think it's a really interesting subject um, and, and one of the seven issues that you that you've commented on about uh, about kind of income. So let me let me offer you this, Dan. You know, we we sit here and we we're having this conversation and we talk about you know all of these challenges that retirees face that you know. They need lifetime income. They need protection from inflation. You know, they need to protect themselves from the volatility of the financial markets. They need to have a sense of purpose in their lives. They need to have regular social interaction. You know, so, you know, why do people need all of these things? Because they don't have a job. Right? The problem with re- paying with retirement is you don't have a paycheck anymore. You don't have a job to go to. You don't have the camaraderie of the office. You, know, you don't have that sense of purpose that a job that you enjoy can provide. And I would say that you, know, you want to solve the retirement puzzle? Keep working. Have a paycheck coming in. And... I think that this, you know, is going to be a big issue and a subject of discussion over, you know, the next 10 years. And let's think about it from three different perspectives. Okay. First of all, there's the individual. Well, that's what we're talking about here. You know, how do I pay for retirement? Well, I'll tell you what, if you can go out and you can find a part-time job that pays you $30,000 a year not only will you have the camaraderie, not only will you have the sense of purpose, but getting $30,000 a year, if you use a 4% withdrawal rate, that's like having three quarters of a million dollars added to your nest egg. It's a huge win for the individual. But let's also think about it from a society point of view. We have all these issues that people talk about. You know, how are we going to fund government pensions? You know, why do we have these inflationary pressures? You know, why... Are we having labor shortages? Why do we have this huge trade deficit? Well, fundamentally, it's not a financial issue. It's a demographic problem. We, have, we are moving to a world where we have too few workers and too many people dependent on goods and services that they provide. What we need to do is to shift that back so there are more people producing goods and services and less people dependent upon their labor. And governments need to get smart about this. They need to start creating financial incentives for older citizens to stay in the workforce. You know, maybe it means giving them tax break. You know, maybe it means, you know, mandating certain requirements for the, you know, in terms of ageism and so on in the workforce so that corporations don't kick these people out. And then in terms of employers, you know, Smart employers today should be trying to figure out how they can create jobs that are appealing to older citizens, you know, that involve less physical labor, that offer, you know, flexibility in terms of hours. You know, if we can get to the point where more people are willing to stay in the workforce for longer, a whole slew of societal problems will be solved. But for now, it's not on the, it's not on the policy agenda. People just aren't talking about it. And yet it's the most bleeding obvious solution out there. We need to find a way to get people to work for longer, not only for their own good, but also for the good of society. I absolutely 100% agree. I mean, I, 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 um, I wrote a blog piece, seven reasons why working should be part of your retirement plan. I know that you've written about this before and it's, it's on so many fronts that this helps the individual and society, as you said. You, um, I see it a lot where people are almost st- stepping back from the workforce in their prime, right? They, they've got so much knowledge and wisdom and energy still to give. And the, the, the young people are missing out on being kind of mentored, whether it's officially or non officially, but by people with so much to give back to them. And not only that, you know, 
corporations out there are going to retain this stuff and benefit from people's knowledge and wisdom. And then the individual, you 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 mentioned actually in some of the things that you've written, and I've done the same about you're getting back things that you lose, right? I think a lot of people forget the things that they're losing when they stop work. So stuff like income, identity, purpose, structure, uh, status, uh, sense of community, the water cooler conversations, um, and everything that you get with it. And I think, it, as you said, it just solves to me a lot of problems. The definition of retirement needs to stop it wasn't that long ago, right? And you might know when this was in terms of years, but it wasn't that long ago that it was actually mandated to stop work, right? There was a forced retirement date. And we're not talking hundreds of years ago here. Um, So we need to change the attitude. Working, in my opinion, should be part of everyone's retirement plan. It might mean that you change career. It might mean that you go and do something that you've always thought about doing. And it doesn't mean you do it five days a week, 40 hours a day, right? So I think it, we all need to kind of make sure that we understand that. I really want to touch on um, just those losses with you. Is there one or two of those seven losses that you mentioned, uh, income, identity, purpose, structure, community, relevance, and power, um, that you think is really relevant just to bring up and, and spend five minutes on um, to, to talk about? Well, I think they're all important, but I think this... Um one, the notion of identity is important. I mean, who out of us out there really wants to go, you know, to a party when people ask, you know, what do you do? And you say, you know, I'm a retiree. <laughs> I mean, you know, people's identity from their work is hugely important. And when you go from, you know, being, I'm, you know, an engineer, I'm a lawyer to being, I'm a retiree, it's a letdown. And it's a psychological blow. And certainly, you know, you know, I find myself resting on my past laurels. You know, when people say, well, you know, what do you do for a living? I was like, well, I used to <laughs> yeah, work for the Wall it. Street Journal. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. People start with that, don't they? I used to do this. I used to do that. I used to do this. It's not the thing. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. No, you want to be able to say, you know, I, you know, I volunteer at this. I work three days a week at that. Um, you know, you need that identity and sort of twin with that identity. And I think this is probably, you know, even more important, you know, is we do need, you know, that sense of purpose in life. We do need that reason to get out of bed in the morning. Um, you know, as you know, Dan, you know, I've spent a lot of my uh, career writing about money and happiness. And there are really three pillars to a happy financial life. One is, you know, this sense of autonomy that comes from having your finances in good order, you know, having a decent amount of money in the bank, knowing that, you know, your world is not going to get rocked because you lose your job or because the stock market drops 30 percent. So financial security is a key pillar of happiness. You know, I say to people that, you know, money is sort of like health. It's only when you don't have it that, that you really appreciate it, you know. When you're in good health, everything's fine. When you feel ill, you know, the only thing you want to do is get better. It's the same with money. When you don't have money, having money is the one thing you want to have. Once you have money, you don't really think about it that much. Two, you need that sense of of social connection. You need a robust social network of friends and family. That's, and of course, you know, work gives you that. And then three, you want to be able to spend your days doing stuff that you think are as important, that you find challenging, that gives you a sense of purpose that you feel that you're good at. And that too is something that work gives you. So in many ways, having a job gives you the three key elements that are crucial to happy financial life. You know, one of the big things here in the US, and I imagine that it's also there in the UK, is the so-called FIRE movement, financial independence, retire early. And the fire movement here has had got huge amounts of publicity over the last 10 or 15 years. I'm now proposing that we actually have um, an alternative to the fire movement, and I want to call it the ICE movement, I-C-E. I'll continue earning. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Trademark that quickly. Trademark that quickly. I love that. Very good. Yeah. yeah. So the ICE movement. I, I, yeah. I, I'm saying it here and now for the first time on your podcast, Dan. <laughs> I think the ICE movement is going to be the wave of the future. Yeah. 
Yeah, I, look, I couldn't agree more. Couldn't agree more. And and it's that you know, we, we, I, I do think we there's the, um, the the kind of in the science of happiness, isn't there? They talk about the U curve in life when we end up being probably at our uh, least happy in our late forties, early fifties, and we're coming out the other side. And so that I think that makes the transition. If we you get, replace the word retirement with second half of life, however, there's so many different phrases. But that part of life, if we kind of say we might live to age 100, we've made it to age 50, we might have another 50 years. That second half of life is so crucial because we might have been through 10 years previously of pretty hard stuff. We might have uh, growing growing up children that cause us, uh, well, I've got them, they cause you one or two issues. We might have elderly parents that we have to emotionally and financially support. And you're coming out of that kind of area where it's more about you, your passions, your purpose, and pursuing those for the first time. So, uh, or for the first time in a long time. And that's where that, you know, that link to happiness comes in. I think at that point in our lives, we want to try and search out happiness more so than we've done for quite a vast number of years. Um, there's a couple of points quickly on that, actually, because when I was reading your stuff, you you mentioned two points. You've already kind of talked about one, pursue your passions and, and have purpose. But there's another one um, that you put about avoiding comparisons, which I find fascinating. I think uh, it, it, it's, um, I wrote something um, a couple of weeks ago about how us as humans, we kind of tend, tend to think in relative terms, not absolute terms. And I think it's a real danger for people going into retirement that they don't focus on themselves and they're worried about what other people are doing or not doing. So the uh, the birth of happiness research as conducted by economists goes back to 1974, an economist at the University of Southern California called Dick Easterlin. And he, back in 1974, wrote this paper that didn't get a whole lot of publicity at the time and pointed out that even though, um, and he looked at a couple of different societies, even though these societies had grown wealthier and seen higher income over time, their reported happiness had not budged. And, you know, the Eastland paradox is that, you know, even as income and wealth rises, happiness doesn't tend to increase because people don't think in absolute terms, they think in relative terms. And, you know, if you look around and, you know, all you see are richer neighbors, it's going to hurt your happiness. This is why, you know, you shouldn't want to go to that resort you can barely afford because you're just going to sit there and think all these people I'm with, they have much more money than me. I can barely afford this and I feel inadequate. You don't want to go into that store where you can barely afford the clothes or you can barely afford the jewelry because again, you'll look around and say, wow, I really feel poor because I can't really afford anything in this store. You want to live in a town, in a neighborhood, go on vacations, go to stores, where you will be with people of similar affluence because that way the comparisons don't work against you. And in fact, if you really want to feel good, go move to a poor neighborhood and be the richest person yeah. on the street. Then yeah, you'll feel yeah. really good. Yeah. Do, do you think we're at a time though where, you know, thinking about a modern day retirement when um, – in brackets, social media, um, it, it, you know, there is more in our face about comparison now, isn't there, than, than I think there's ever been. You know, not only are we comparing ourselves to our neighbours, we we now compare ourselves to so many other people that we have never met before that end up putting, um, you know, maybe fake pictures, I'm, I'm not judging, uh, but maybe fake pictures on social that show this kind of this continuous happiness and wonderful life. And I think it's a real challenge and danger for people entering into retirement that they keep keep comparing and keep thinking in relative terms. Yeah, no, you're absolutely right. I mean, nobody, well, people rarely post on social media, oh, I had a really awful day. My kids hate me. Yeah. I had an yeah. argument yeah. with my spouse yeah. and so yeah. on and so on. Yeah. But, you know, that is the reality. People don't reveal that stuff. You know, when my kids were young and we would take, you know, walks through the neighborhood and we would pass big houses and my kids would say, you know, oh, they must be rich. And of course, you know, me being me, I'd say, you know, you have no idea, you know, the house may be heavily mortgaged, yeah. you know, the landscaper may not have been paid, the two German automobiles in the driveway may be leased, and they may be spending their evenings sitting around with the credit card statements, 
fighting about how they're going to pay the minimum monthly payment. You just do not know. You know, there is enormous virtue to being the millionaire next door, the person who lives comfortably within their means. You know, they drive the secondhand cars. You know, they don't spend to the max of their income because in the end, you know, you have that sense of financial security that knows that you're going to be okay no matter what life throws at you, whether you lose your job or the stock market goes down. But if you're those people who have the heavily mortgaged house with the two leased German automobiles and so on and so on, you're living on the edge. And trust me, they are not happy people. Mm, Absolutely. Um, I want to kind of go into wrapping up the episode and, uh, with you. It's been such a wonderful conversation um, that, and, and we could go on forever, but I'll, I'll try and um, try and get to an end point. Um, we, you, you penned a great article, and I think it's really relevant to everything that we've talked about, called Second Childhood. Um, and I, I, again, I talk to a lot of people about this people I work with, and I've done some sketches and written a little bit about this, but no, nowhere near kind of what you did. Um, but but this kind of I think for the first time since we were children, since you know we, we enter a period in, in our life that we can be childlike again, we can be curious, we can explore. Um, I'd love for you just to spend a couple of minutes on that and get your views as we wrap up because I think it's such an important um, framework and a wonderful way to start to thinking about start to thinking about our retirement. So, Dan, uh, in many ways, I um, have been precocious my entire life. You know, I, when I got out of college, um, I was the kid who swore he would never get married. He would never have kids. You know, within a year, I was engaged. Within two years, I was married. Within three years, I was a father. (laughs) And so I didn't have that sort of typical 20s where you went bar hopping and you had very few concerns. I went straight into adulthood with all the financial worries and all the parenting that goes with it. But the flip side of what that was, by the time I was in my early 50s, I was done raising kids. My kids were off at college and I was able to have this second childhood, a second childhood that for many people doesn't come until their 60s. So I've spent the last 10 years pretty much doing what I want. And, you know, I've tried all kinds of stuff. As I mentioned earlier in the podcast, you know, I tried teaching. I was involved with a financial startup. I wrote a number of books. I did some consulting. I gave some paid speeches and so on and so on. And I think there's a couple of things that I would suggest to listeners about this. First is, you know, you do not really know what, is going to make you happy. You need to do some experimenting. So when you get into early retirement and you're trying to figure out what to do, don't assume that you know until you try it. So I thought that I would love teaching and I signed on to be an adjunct professor at a small private university teaching personal finance. And I'd always love talking about personal finance. I'd always love giving speeches. And what I discovered was I hated teaching. (laughs) I just was not good at it. You know, the kids, I just couldn't get the response from the kids. You know, it it wasn't what I thought. And so I would say to people heading into retirement, you know, you should think of these early years as a period of experimentation. And it may take you a few years to figure out what it is that's gonna make your retirement fulfilling. But the second thing, and this was not really part of that article, but I will make, mention it here because it sort of comes back to a lot of the stuff that we've been talking about, Dan, which is at this point, you know, I've settled into this groove where I run this website and I make a certain amount from advertising revenue. And I also take donations from on the site. And then I also do a little bit of work for an investment advisory firm. And the money I make from these various ventures, plus the, the royalties from books, basically it means I don't have to tap my portfolio. And, you know, I, at this juncture, have no intention of quitting any of this stuff. I plan to carry on, you know, running the website and, you know, writing books and doing work for this investment advisor firm for as long as I can. Why wouldn't I do that? One, it's a huge financial bonus, but two, it makes for a fulfilling life. It gives me a sense of purpose. It is the reason, you know, that I got out of bed this morning at 4.30 a.m. because I was excited 
to get started on the day. And my plan and my hope is that continues to be the case. That is a wonderful place to wrap this up on. Um, Jonathan, you, you do some amazing work. You've written some amazing books. You pen some brilliant articles. And you've got some wonderful writers on Humble Dollar. Where can people search you out? I'm going to put all the links into the show notes uh, to, to Humble Dollar and the books. But give the people the, the, the places where to go to, to, to search you out and find out all the wonderful work you do. Oh, it's very easy. All you have to do is go to humbledollar.com. Um, the site today, I put up maybe a dozen articles every week. Uh, we put out uh, two weekly newsletters. It's all free. Um, the entire site is free. I, as I uh, just mentioned, you know, the way this the site is funded is through donations and through a little bit of advertising revenue. We don't do any of the blocking games with sponsored content or sponsored link or affiliate marketing. It's all very transparent and it is, you know, for the user, completely free. So stop on by. If you like what you see, that's great. If you, it's not for you, that's fine too. But uh, have a visit. Yeah, one of I'll put all the links in into it because it is there's some brilliant stuff on there, absolutely brilliant. Jonathan, that just leaves me to um, really kind of extend a massive thank you for taking the time out of your day and and sharing your knowledge and your wisdom and everything that you've uh, experienced so far um, thinking about your retirement. And I know you're going to experience. Uh, lots more as you as you do all this wonderful work and continue doing it. So, uh, a, a massive thank you for joining us today. Oh, thank you, Dan, for the uh, the great conversation. It's been fun talking to you. Awesome. Uh, and that just leaves me to thank uh, everybody once again for listening in to the Humans versus Retirement podcast. Until next time, take care. Thanks for tuning in to the Humans versus Retirement podcast. I hope. This show will arm you with insights, strategies, and a newfound excitement for navigating life beyond the nine to five grind. Remember, retirement isn't just an endpoint, it's a vibrant chapter brimming with opportunities for growth, adventure, and purpose. Keep exploring, stay curious, and embrace the next phase of your life with enthusiasm. Until next time, may your retirement dreams continue to flourish and inspire. <laughs>